everyone. Uh, glad you can <coughs> be here. Glad we can be together today. So many, um, I want to say old faces, old friends, or um, so many familiar faces, long time, long time friends and members of the community and some perhaps joining for the first time today. Feel free if you'd like to, to, um, to change your name, not change your name, I'm sure you're happy with your name, but to add where you're joining us from, particularly if you're from um, outside of our area. Um, you know, Kenny's there from, sorry, Kerry's there from, um, from uh, Saskatoon uh, in Canada and uh, Linnea's with us from Washington State. Good to, good to see you. Jackie in Maine. That's our Jackie in Maine, isn't it? <laughs> good to see you. Um, Bill's here, Bill, Bill's here, good to see you. Bill Weed, always good to see you, Bill. And Diane from uh, Durham, North Carolina. Good to see you, Karen, here in Washington, D.C. And Rachel, um, Lincoln, Nebraska, great to have you with us. And Patricia and Philip in St. Petersburg, Florida. Good to see you, Adrian, from about a block from me. <laughs> We're very close to neighbors. Let's see who else is. Uh, Susan from Pittsburgh and Stephanie from Naples, Florida. Juliana, good to see you back from Irvine. California and uh, many, many familiar faces, um, Cheryl and Jennifer, Linda, good to see you, good to be with you again and um, just particularly just welcoming those from uh, more, more distant places who are able to, uh, to join us. Sean from Toronto, Canada, good to see you. Welcome. And Nick, who's running the show. <laughs> good. And all, all, all of our, our regular folks, welcome. Collins from um, Walnut Creek, who's, uh, I think, moving back to, uh, to the area soon. And uh, Betty and Joe from Charlottesville, good to have you with us. Welcome. Did I say Denise in, in Albuquerque? Anyway, welcome to you all. And um, I think as Nick mentioned, we're, uh, we're, we're coming to um, a year that we've been together online. And uh, <clears throat> It's been a, you know, it's been a gift and a challenge, this, um, a gift to be able to be together in this way um, when we can't, haven't been able to be together in person. And it's wonderful to have folks joining us from um, more distant um, places who obviously wouldn't be able to join us um, on a regular basis if we were in, per if we were in person. Sometimes we have folks from, from, uh, from Europe and South Africa as well. Yeah, may, and just reflecting as we come to a year, just over a year since the WHO declared the uh, uh, worldwide pandemic. Um, it's been quite uh, a journey and we've been, on a journey together, but in our own different ways. You know, this sometimes people say we're, you know, we're, 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 we've all been in the same boat, but I think it's much more accurate to say we've been in the same storm, but in different boats. And some people have, you know, had the good fortune or the grace to be going through this period in maybe a, a luxury yacht metaphorically speaking, and others in a kind of relatively kind of middle-class boats and some, some in very 
rickety boats and uh, you know very very unseaworthy boats and so you know I think one of the gifts of our of our practice of this practice is of mindfulness and compassion and loving kindness is to be able to hold all of us to hold those who are suffering with compassion <clears throat> those who are you know doing well kind of flowing easily with what's going on to you know to meet that <clears throat> with happiness in 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 their happiness you know in, in the Pali language uh, it's called mudita m-u-d-i-t-a being happy in the happiness of others um, and to be able to meet everything you know all the, the range of of our experience is with with awareness and with loving kindness and to um, to recognize and remember that we are we are part of this community a community of of beings committed to waking up um, to living skillfully living wisely opening our hearts and part of this community of all beings you know all beings on on a journey to, you could see it as a journey to awakening you know maybe as the buddha spoke about some with a lot of dust in their eyes and others with less dust you know and uh, and um uh, but nonetheless all of us you know all of us working through this you know the this journey of a journey of our lives um and and seeking i think one way and another to untangle the tangles of our lives that's another image that the buddha used there's one of a, a, a sutta a, a talk of the buddha on untangling the tangles it's called the the tangle sutta you know i think ta that a tangle is a word that probably most of us can relate to that we do get caught up in tangles we get entangled in stresses and worry and fear and you know all sorts of different mind states and and this um, the, these practices you know in particular the, particularly the practice of mindfulness as kind of shining a spotlight on whatever our experience is to be able to see where we are tangled and to kind of Un, you know begin that process of untangling the tangles you know almost like we got a, a ball of wool of different colors and sh you know all kind of mixed up together and kind of untangling it so that we can live more wisely more skillfully with with more ease so again just kind of stepping back from getting into a, a talk right now and um, particularly maybe those who are joining us uh, for the first time or who are coming back maybe haven't been with us online or coming back after you know a long time nice to have you with us uh, Carolyn after um, you know we were together going back more than 10 years back to the space where we met together over the um what would they call that burger um burger place z burger wasn't it z burger and they would um they would play a kind of techno music that would come along come on halfway through our session and so we had the we had the 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 mindfulness of pra practice of of working with the you know the activation around the the techno music and some some others may have been with us going back to i think is even prior to 20 2010 so it's changed and we you know we did we we've been a number of different places since then at the center of for mindful living in tenley town and then for a, a few months we went to a lovely center in at iona which is also in tenley town 
And then by the time we'd only been there two months, um, you know, we have a you know eighty or ninety people there in person, and then uh, and then the pandemic came, and we've been online since then, and so we we go with the flow and we change um, to meet the the conditions as it, as is um, you know very much part of our practice of mindfulness and. Uh, you know, for a while I was beginning with a talk um, and then going into a meditation, but sometimes as, um, um, I don't know how I, I can put this kindly um, to myself, sometimes I could go on a little bit and the talk would last longer than I intended to, and then we'd get tight for time and various things. So what we've been doing for the last month or two has been beginning with a meditation. We're not quite beginning because I've talked a fair bit up to now, but not a formal talk. And so we've been beginning with a meditation. And what's what's nice about that is we can take a little bit longer for the meditation. And I think many people find that when we begin with the meditation, it's possible to kind of settle into a different kind of internal space, kind of move more out of our heads down into the body, into our experience. So we've been beginning with that, then sharing a, sharing a talk. You know, it's not a long talk, but you know, typically 20, 25 minutes or so. Then Emily leads us in some guided um, movement, which is a lovely way of coming into, you know, actively coming into the body. Then we'll have some sharing typically in, in um, small groups, breakout rooms, um, which um, Nick or, you know, today and, you know, Pat at other times and other Dan will um, kind of lead, you know, break us up into groups and uh, do some sharing for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll come back for another shorter meditation to finish. And then with some announcements. So that's kind of the format of the session. the times are somewhat fungible based on how long one piece lasts, kind of adaptable to that. <clears throat> um, so, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll begin kind of formal, formally, if you like, with, uh, we assume what I've been sharing has been a more informal beginning. We'll, we'll have a, um, a, a period of sitting. It'll be about 20 minutes. And um, the focus I, of the meditation today is to cultivate a, um, a, kind of a spacious awareness. <clears throat> you know, an invitation is kind of to make the mind like the sky. So kind of a little different from meditation using the breath or using you know the body or um, or a mantra for example where we kind of focus inward on a particular object and here the invitation will be to kind of open into a more spacious awareness and you're obviously free to do whatever works for you if you find that spacious awareness spacey and not helpful by all means, just come back to the body, come back to the breath, be your own best judge of what's most helpful. But it can be helpful to, I find this to be a, a meditation that can be, um, that can be quite supportive, particularly if the mind is relatively settled and calm. Sometimes there's a way of settling and calming the mind, just opening to that larger space. So with that, um, I'd invite you to find a posture that's comfortable, relaxed, where you can be at ease. So letting yourself settle sitting with your back straight or whatever posture is comfortable for you, lying down if you'd like to do, do the meditation, lying down. That's one of the four postures in the Buddhist meditation, the sitting, 
standing, walking and reclining. So all of those kind of recognized postures for meditation. So find what works for you. Most, most of us will be sitting, so I'll give kind of the guidance just for as though everyone's sitting, but however, yeah, whatever works for you. So let your attention come into the body, closing your eyes if you like, letting your attention come inward. And letting your awareness drop down out of the thinking mode down into the body. So feel the body, feel the contact with the surface beneath you, the chair or cushion. Feel the contact of your, your feet with the floor. So if you can feel the, the body from the inside, tingling, pressure, pulsing, warmth, whatever's here, whatever's present. Letting your shoulders relax, allowing your hands to rest comfortably in the lap or on your knees. You might connect with your breath. Breath is a very good barometer of, you know, our sense of well-being or stress. You know, if we're stressed, we the breath tends to be short and tight. And we're more relaxed, the breath is deeper, typically more relaxed. So just notice how your breathing is. And you might consciously deepen the breath just as a way of helping you relax and settle. Taking a nice deep in breath, filling the lungs, filling the chest. And releasing, relaxing, letting go on the out breath. <clears throat> Breathing in. Filling the body, filling the lungs with the breath. Breathing out, letting go, relaxing, relaxing any tension on the out breath. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. So letting this invitation to deepen the breath be a way of relaxing into being here. As you take a couple more deeper breaths, you might invite a smile to your face. A smile naturally helps relax the body and the mind. Inviting a relaxing of the corners of the eyes and the corners of the mouth. Maybe thinking of a, a loved one or somebody who easily makes you feel happy and joyful. Inviting the breath and the smile to help you settle into being here, relaxing into being here. Maybe taking a moment to reflect on gratitude, to Think about some things in your life that you feel grateful for. Loved ones, friends, maybe conditions in your life, 
some sense of security, support of others. Your religious practice or spiritual practice. So many things in our life that we can appreciate, but a lot of the time we tend to focus on what's wrong, what we need or don't have. So it can be very much kind of focused, fixated on, on what we don't have or what we need. Just switching, turning the attention back to gratitude. can help us shift out of that mode, appreciating what we have, even if things are really difficult, perhaps especially if things are difficult, it can be helpful, at times powerful, to, to reflect on gratitude. <clears throat> connecting with the life that's here. It can be helpful to put a hand on the heart, the chest or on the belly. Connecting with your own life, your joys, your sorrows, challenges. <clears throat> is caring for this life. Feeling perhaps too the support of community just here together with 90 or so people all committed to, to seeing waking up and letting go of unnecessary suffering. Settling into being here. Opening to what's present right now in the body and the heart and the mind. <clears throat> Just opening to what's present and in the words, words of Rumi, the Sufi poet, welcoming the guests, just inviting a welcoming attitude to, <clears throat> to whatever is present right now. <clears throat> As Rumi says, even if there are a crowd of sorrows who sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. Noticing what's present for you, what's arising in the body, bodily feelings, sensations. What emotions, moods, mind states are present. See if you can meet whatever is here with a a welcoming attitude, just letting it be, letting it come, letting it go. A 
and you can you might invite your awareness to be to be bigger than the body bigger than just your head what's going on in the brain just envision your awareness as being much more expansive filling the space in the room that you are bigger still you know, going upward and outward to fill the whole sky imagine envision your awareness as as big as the sky as wide as the sky Just like the sky is open and spacious and all sorts of things pass through the sky, birds, insects, aeroplanes. Clouds. <clears throat> wind. All passing through the sky, but the sky remains open and spacious. And in the same way, our awareness can be open and spacious, even while feelings come up, stay for a while, thoughts come up, and if we don't hook on to them, they just come and go, like birds passing through the sky bodily feelings come, stay for a while and pass, like clouds passing through the sky. <clears throat> so just inviting, letting the, <coughs> excuse me, letting the, letting your awareness, letting the mind be like, like the sky. Just experiencing whatever is coming up, just passing through the sky, like clouds or like birds or like aeroplanes, in this open space of awareness. Feel how your breathing comes and goes. In breath and out breath. Just coming and going. Just like a breeze passing through the sky. Notice how bodily feelings, maybe a feeling of pressure or tingling or pulsing, just comes into awareness. And then if we don't resist it or hold on to it, just comes and goes in its own time. Just inviting this awareness of everything coming, staying for a while and then passing in this open, space of awareness. If a strong emotion comes See so if you can experience that too as just coming and going within this open space of awareness, this wide open sky of awareness. So if we feel some sadness, we just connect with the sensations. Maybe there's some teariness or some fluttering around the heart. 
and just allow space for those feelings to come and to go. It's like clouds passing through the sky. If a thought comes up connected with an emotion or just comes up out of kind of out of the mystery, just make space for that too. Just letting it come, but choosing not to hook onto it, just letting it come and go. <clears throat> sensations, feelings, emotions, thoughts, sounds, coming, staying for a while, and passing within this open sky of awareness, this open space of awareness. This from Li Po, the eighth century Chinese poet, Zazen on Ching Ting Mountain. The birds, <clears throat> the birds have vanished down the sky. Now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me until only the mountain remains. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. everything coming, going in this open space of awareness. So everything arising in the body and the heart and the mind can be held, met, experienced within this frame, this way of seeing, this open space of awareness. Just 
there's this dance of sensation and emotion and thoughts and images and sounds all coming and going with the with the emphasis more on the space than on the specifics of the of the object So if we're practicing mindfulness of breathing, we're kind of focusing in on the breath, kind of almost like a zoom lens on a camera. And when we're opening to this open, spacious awareness, it's like we're opening the focus, like a wide, wide angle lens on the camera, but just everything included this wide open space, each of them just a, <clears throat> a way of seeing, a way of experiencing what's happening, a way of experiencing our experience through this particular lens. This is from um, Ramon, uh, one Ramon Jimenez poem, Oceans, in, in English. I have a feeling that my boat has struck down there in the depths against a great thing, and nothing happens. <clears throat> nothing. Silence, waves. Nothing happens, or has everything happened? And we're standing now quietly in the new life. Nothing happens, or has everything happened? And we're standing now quietly in the new life. Everything coming and going, rising and passing in this open space of awareness, this open sky of awareness. This is from Anna Swear. Polish poet called Priceless Gifts. An empty day without events, and that is why it grew immense as space, and suddenly happiness of being entered me. I heard in my heartbeat the birth of time and each instant of life, one after the other came rushing in like priceless gifts. I heard in my heartbeat the birth of time and each instant of life, one after the other, came rushing in like priceless gifts.
for taking the time coming back and I hope this I hope that was um, <clears throat> maybe helpful it's something that might be you know might explore if it's if it's part if it's not currently you know part of, of your practice that it's another it's another mode, another way of seeing, another way of looking at our experience and of practicing. Um, and um, <clears throat> I was, I'm thinking about what I'd like to share um, in these next few minutes. And um, I recall somebody saying, um, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Well, you've heard that one before. <laughs> I don't have time to give a short talk, so I'm going to give a long one. Um, <laughs> um, I, I actually want to do the opposite. <laughs> I, have, I have probably more to say than time to say it right now. Um, but what I'm, what I'm wanting to share about today, I have a, I had a kind of a, a theme for the talk or a name for the talk, which is, um, what did I call this? Something like ways of looking, practicing, practicing meta with one T. If you're kind of familiar with, with meta, probably most people are familiar with meta, the Pali word for, um, for loving kindness, friendliness. You know, we practice meta a lot. And then there's the other meaning of meta, M-E-T-A, which is kind of the sense of a meta awareness, you know, an awareness of our experience, a kind of stepping up from, back from, and looking at that. And, and, and the question I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in exploring, and there's been kind of a lot in my practice over maybe over the last year particularly is is kind of can be framed maybe in terms of a question what are we doing when we're doing what we're doing what are we doing when we're doing what we're doing so the kind of awareness of what we're doing you know when we're doing what we're doing you know, a kind of long long sentence but um you know a question like what are the you know, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, what are the, you know, being clear both about what we're doing and what is the purpose? What is the intention? What is maybe the goal of what we're doing? You know, what is the goal of, of and I don't mean goal in a kind of a narrow, of, you know, clinging sense, certainly, but what is kind of where are we going with what we're doing? Um, and because we're all here um, here today and practicing in a kind of in an ongoing way, exploring practices of meditation and mindfulness, for some reason, you know, it may not be one that we're very, we've necessarily articulated very clearly to ourselves. It may be just a sense of, oh, this could do me some good, could be helpful. It may be much clearer than that. We might be very clear about, I want to wake up in this very life. You know, I want to follow the path of the Buddha, mother, wise teachers and practitioners. And we may be in many different places along the spectrum. But what I'm wanting to get at is that, that it's helpful, I think, to kind of ask the question, to step back and say, you know, what is it that we're doing and why are we doing what we're doing? So even taking... <clears throat> excuse me, taking the practice that we just explored in the meditation, cultivating a kind of spacious awareness of mind like the sky. Um, what, what, you know, what is the, what, you know, what are we doing this for? What we're taking this, this, this um, quality of attention, this, um, what is the word I'm looking for, this faculty, this faculty of awareness, this kind of the way we can direct our attention and use our attention. And this, this way we're kind of inviting it into a kind of a wide open awareness. So it's just one example 
of, if you like, of a way of looking that is going to have some, presumably have some effect, you know, so, and I'm going to look at some of the, some of these different ways of looking, um, you know, but the, but the questions we might ask, is, is it helpful to do this? Uh, or maybe does it not seem helpful? You know, maybe I got all spaced out doing that meditation and it wasn't so helpful. Um, we might, we might do a meditation like that and we might say, oh no, I just felt really spacey or I felt really disconnected. So I'm not going to do that again. That's never, you know, I'm not going to do that. But typically one time of doing anything can only tell you a limited amount of thing. Maybe you were tired. Maybe you were, you know, just, you know, there's a lot going on in your life. I mean, typically we have to, the Buddha talked about what we are doing in the broad sense of what we're doing as a training, you know, a training to wake up to the fullest possibilities of what we can be as a human being. Um, and there are many, many ways that we can train the mind and train the heart, you know, one one way of you know i mean I'll, I'll just mention a number of the ways that we can uh, you know a number of different um either attitudes or skills that we can practice they're not all a generic kind of one you know it's not one one practice focus on breath focus on the body those are different ways focus on a spacious awareness but i'm also including attitudes so take some of the typical um, invitations in our practice. For example, to meet our experience with, without judgment, a non-judging awareness of our experience. So we can, I might ask ourselves, I, I, why are we why are we bringing why are we practicing non-judgment why and how does it purport to be helpful to bring this non-judging awareness to our experience so whatever's coming up just have that filter that lens of that way of looking without judgment well you can say not judging our experience and just being aware of feelings what we're hearing, what we're seeing, what we're thinking, um, helps us not be so caught up in adding things that aren't helpful to our experience. We don't so much add second arrows. You know, I've done this. Oh, I got angry with somebody, you know, and then we're very easily we judge ourselves for being angry. You know, we add that second arrow. Well, the anger is just the first arrow. The second arrow is, I shouldn't be angry. I'm a Buddhist or I'm a mindfulness practitioner. We shouldn't be, you know, we're adding that unnecessary second arrow to our experience. So non-judgment helps us kind of not do that so much. We might still do it, but then we can meet that too with non-judgment. You know, so, so non-judgment can be so exclusive as to include everything. Oh, I got angry. Or I felt, oh, I'm doing really great. Oh, that's pride coming up. I can meet that too without judging myself for being, you know, oh, I'm a great meditator or whatever it might be. Practicing non-judgment, we might see more clearly that everything comes and goes. We might see the impermanence, the emptiness of nothing can be hung on to. And that can be helpful in that way. So that's just an example of non-judging as a framework, a way of looking at our experience. It's kind of like a, a, a glasses or spectacles that we put on and we look at our experience. I'm looking at my experience through that filter, through the filter, through the lens of not judging myself. Just one of many different lenses and we can do use different ones at the same time. For example, acceptance. We talk a lot about acceptance in this practice. Meet your experience. Can you meet this? You've probably heard me say this if you've come often to these practices, probably more than anything else. It's kind of, can you meet this with kindness, with acceptance, without judgment? You know, 
um, maybe with curiosity, all of these, you know, they all bring not, they're not all the same, they're not interchangeable, but they have some overlap to them. So acceptance, why, why would it be helpful to meet, you know, to meet our experience, to meet whatever is coming up with acceptance? Well, if we do that, then we're really accepting all parts of ourselves. You know, whatever's coming up, anger, rage, can I meet this with acceptance? And in meeting it with acceptance, then we don't cling to it. We're not in a tangle with that. It. it can come and go. Even, you know, God forbid we had, you know, a murderous thought about somebody we don't like. You know, if it's just a thought, it's just, you know, it's not a very nice thought, but it's, it can come and go. It's the problem comes with thoughts when we attach to them. We think, yeah, this person did this and therefore I should do this to them and all of that. And, and then that's where we get in trouble. We add the second arrow and the third and the fourth arrow to our experience. So can we, can we just meet our experience with acceptance? We don't, then we're less fixated on the thing and, get, and then we suffer less. And with all of these practices, with kindness, with non-judgment, with acceptance, we're looking at it over time, you know, not just on one occasion, you know, maybe on one occasion, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting my experience, what happens when I do this, but particularly over time, what happens when over time I cultivate non-judgment, I cultivate acceptance, what happens when I bring kindness as the way of looking. You know, so that whatever's here, whatever's arising, whatever's coming in from the world, I'm meeting it with that, within that framework of kindness. Kindness is like the container that holds whatever comes up. So if anger comes up, can I meet this with kindness? Again, we can look at that and say, well, what's the, what's the benefit of doing this? How does this help us to do this? Well, it softens these tendencies to identify and cling or to judge and blame if I can meet my experience with kindness as acceptance does as well, but in a, in a somewhat different way, in a more affective way, in a more kind of emotional way, in a more heartfelt way maybe. Similarly with another quality that we cultivate, we talk about a lot, that's curiosity being interested in our experience, what might that bring? Um, it might help us see what we might otherwise exclude. We're being curious, because if we're not curious, we might steer away from things that we don't like or, or that we're unfamiliar with. But with curiosity, we're just saying, oh, this is interesting, isn't it? Oh, this is painful. But if I look at it, it's really quite interesting or this boredom that I'm experiencing right now. If I become curious about it, it actually shifts. Oh, that's interesting too. Can I be curious about that? So curiosity. So thinking about all of these as ways of seeing, ways of looking at our experience, ways of being with our experience. Loving kindness is another way of, of being with our experience. It's another way of looking. So we can look at any and all of these qualities, skills, but more broadly ways of looking at our experience as being doorways, different metaphors we can use, doorways or vehicles to lead us towards where we're wanting to go. You know, that's the important thing. We're doing this for a reason. We cultivate acceptance rather than cultivating judgment or anger. You know, we could, and maybe we have done in our lives a lot, cultivated anger, cultivated self-judgment. You know, we haven't necessarily said, I want to be an angry person or I want to be a judgmental person, but that's what we've actually fueled a lot by keeping doing things, you know, over and over again, that's what we're fueling. We're fueling the anger by saying, yeah, it's right for me to be angry with that politician, you know, or that, you know, 
family member who's always doing things that annoy me, you know, that what we're doing is we're cultivating ways of looking that lead us to or claim or, or put out the claim, let's say, that they lead us to well-being and happiness. We don't have to believe, though, that they lead us to well-being and happiness, because the essence really of this practice is to see for ourselves what happens when I do practice awareness? What happens when I do bring kindness to my experience? What happens when I look at my experience through this way of seeing, of, um, of curiosity or of loving kindness? So what I'm pointing to is that these are all doorways. I mean, it's very, the way I'm using this ways of looking I think is similar to how in Zen they talk about Dharma doors, you know, doorways to the Dharma, doorways to freedom of the heart. And that what's helpful for us, I would argue, is to use as many of these doorways, these ways of looking at our experience as possible so that we have resources at, that some may be more useful at one time than another, but that we have more and more capacity to deal with all that's arising in the body and the heart and the, and the mind. So sometimes we might get something really difficult to come up. We might need a number of different skills, coming back, putting our hand on a heart, taking some deeper breath, cultivating self-compassion. You know, all of these things, maybe we need, you know, a number of these different skills. Um, and the more facility we have in these different ways of looking, they're all simply doorways, you know, whatever metaphor we want to use. They're all impermanent, they're all changing, they're all empty of inherent existence, and they can be extremely helpful. It's like, you know, something that we use that we know is, you know, is, is impermanent, you know, a, a, a glass, you know, a glass of water, you know, for, for you know, for, um, putting water in to drink, you know, Ultimately, it has no permanent existence. This glass sometime is going to break or be thrown away or whatever and go back to the earth and change form. But nonetheless, it's a really helpful thing for the thing I'm wanting to do. In the same way, these ways of looking, even though they're empty in themselves, are very useful or can be very useful in terms of taking us where we need to go. And it is important that we to, that to know where we're wanting to go. I come back to the great teacher, Yogi Berra, who said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. We will end up someplace else if we don't know where we're going. So. What I'm the invitation today, and I've, I've raised this at different times, brought up this up at different times, that to be aware of this kind of meta awareness, this meta, this, this, this ways of looking at our practice, um, to be able to see what's helpful and does it take us where we're, where we're wanting to go. Even a teaching like the Four Noble Truths, you know, about suffering and the end of suffering. I've mentioned that the Buddha talked about this as, as the elephant's footprint. You know, all of the teachings of the Dharma can fit within the teachings of the Four Noble Truths in the same way of, as all of the animals' footprints, all of the animals in the jungle, their footprints can fit within the footprint of, the, of an elephant. It's a lovely metaphor, I think, or simile, actually like here. Yeah, it's a simile that, that um, 
in the same way, all of the teachings of the, the of the Dharma can fit within the teachings, and they all come back to the teachings of the Four Noble Truths. So we can use the Four Noble Truths as well as one of these doorways, one of these ways of looking, so that in any moment we can look at our experience and we can say, is there suffering right now? Is there suffering? Am I experiencing some unsatisfactoriness, some struggle with the way things are? First noble truth. Am I holding on to anything right now that's contributing to this suffering, that's perpetuating this suffering, so that I'm, I'm implicated in this suffering by my relationship to my experience? Ah, oh, craving, in broad term craving. That's the second noble truth. If I can see that and let go, see the impermanence of the clinging and what I'm clinging to, that they're all just coming and going. And if I don't cling, then, then I don't suffer. Then I can let go. That's the third noble truth. And are there skillful means that I can use to help me to see things clearly and to let go? You know, maybe just the practice of mindfulness, of being aware. This is the fourth noble truth. So I'm using this way of looking of the four noble truths in this case as the doorway to, to, to freedom. You know, just as I'm using the breath, you know, awareness of breath as a way of looking, a way of experiencing what, what's here um, that can lead you know, that potentially leads to, um, to complete freedom from suffering, the Buddha said. You know, any experience, the Buddha taught in his teachings on, on mindfulness, the Satipatthana Sutta, that all, that we can take whatever our experience is in any moment and use that as the doorway, bringing mindfulness to that experience as the doorway as what he says, the direct path to liberation, awareness of the body, you know, tightness in the chest, I can take that and almost ride it as a, as a river all the way to freedom from suffering with enough practice, enough training, enough skill, take us all the way, or a strong emotion, anger or sadness, I can use that as the gateway, as the doorway. This is using the, the the gateway or the doorway of mindfulness as a path to liberation. So all of these, we have all of these ways of looking. Um, and what I'm, the, 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 the kind of the main point I'm making about these is that they can all be skillful means, they can all be doorways to the Dharma, to doorways to freedom from suffering. And I think it's very useful for us to see, to be aware of them as different doorways in, different ways of looking, different frameworks for our experience. So that's what I'm kind of the overarching thing that I'm trying to get at. That we're all, you know, we we do our we do our practice but we don't often or typically kind of step back and kind of take a look. Okay, what is it that I'm doing here? Is this actually a helpful framework for taking me for, to where I want to go? And that also brings up the question, where is it that I want to go? Because if we went round, if we had time to go round everyone here today, we'd probably hear dozens of different articulations of what we're doing this for. You know, some might say, you know, I do want to be free in this very lifetime. Others would might say, you know, I just want a little bit less stress, a little bit more ease. I want to be able to, you know, carry out my family life, my work life, my community life in a way where I can experience some joy, some ease, some calm, some well-being. It may not be the final you know, what the Buddha points to the, as the final freedom from suffering. But nonetheless, um, 
you know, as Arjun Chah says, you let go a little and you'll experience a little peace, a little freedom. Let go a lot and you'll experience a lot of peace, a lot of freedom, a lot of well-being. You let go completely and you'll experience complete peace, complete freedom from suffering. And he finishes by saying, your struggle with the world will be at an end. It's kind of the end of the path, ending the struggle with everything. So we can kind of see our goal as anywhere along the path. Nobody can tell you your goal should be this or that. We can, it's for each one of us, just as we're free to determine how we meet our experience. We're free to determine where we're going, what our goals are in our lifetime. You know, that's what the authority that we each of us have. But it's good to be aware of where we're going, as Yogi Berra said, you know, and, and, and have some clarity about that. And, and what are the ways of looking, ways of seeing? What are the Dharma doorways? What are, what are the practices and skills that can, can take us, can put, claim to be able to take us there? And the question then, do they take us there? Is this useful for me? So I'll leave it there. Um, as something for you to think about, reflect on. Um, what we'll do, looking at the time today, is um, we'll, Emily will lead us in some movement now. I think what we'll do time-wise, we'll stay together um, since we, I think the last three or four weeks we've been doing the breakout groups and we'll go back to them next week, but we'll just stay together and if there's some sharing or questions in the larger group. So I invite Emily to take us from here. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. So take a moment to stand up and feel your feet swaying from side to side. And then open your arms out and sway, coming into a swinging twist. Just moving within this space, within this time, in this moment. And then come to center and bring your arms up and gather the energy of the sky, the sun, the clouds, and the stars beyond, bringing that energy to your heart. Then gather the energy of all of those here today, the kindness, the compassion, the tenderness, and bring that to your heart. And then gather the energy of the earth, the abundance, the beauty, all of it, and bring that to your heart. And now raise your arms again. We'll do a side stretch, placing your left, wrist in your right hand. Inhale and reach up and exhale, tilt over to the right. Inhale back, grasp your right wrist, inhaling up, exhale, tilt over to the left. Inhale up, bring your arms down to cactus arms for a bit of shoulder work. Exhale, bring your hands down, rise, release down and let them rise up. Last time, exhale down and rise. Allow your hands to softly float down, bringing your hands back to your waist. And inhale, lifting your head and chest. Exhale, lengthening your arms. 
and back to your waist. Inhale, lift your head and chest. Exhale, lengthening your arms out. And then release. Last time. Inhale, lift your head and chest. Exhale, lengthen your arms and bring them back to your waist and shake it out. Have a moment to do just your dance in whatever way you might wish to do. And then bring your hands to heart center and release all of the energy we've had to the sky, to the room and to the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Lovely. So, um, please, uh, if you'd like to, please feel free to share anything in the uh, in the chat of how you're doing today or how anything landed for you. Um, what I'd like to, uh, to do is to take a little bit of time for, if anyone would like to share anything that's come up for you that you'd like to share in the, in the whole group, um, or um, if you have a question, please feel free to, uh, to ask that and uh, you can you can indicate electronically um, and we'll look in the participants or just raise your your hand and we'll be on the lookout if anyone would like to to share um, Diane from uh, Durham North Carolina I think I just unmuted myself. Yeah. And it's a little scary talking about it. Anyhow, but what, what has come to mind for me is experiences in my life where things just made no sense for, or I was trying to sort through and figure things out. And then there was a shift and it's, it's a kaleidoscope image for me. You're talking about seeing through different lenses, um, but that, at times it was just sort of like, all of a sudden it was like rotating the kaleidoscope. And then there was this <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> you know, this, um, and that, that yeah, just, it's helpful to me to think about like putting on a different pair of glasses or shifting uh -huh. the lens and that how much can change just with that moment. It's, it's and, how, and how beautiful it is. It's like, oh, it's sort of like an awakening kind of thing. But um, yeah, I need to get myself a kaleidoscope. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great image, the kaleidoscope, and and also just the yeah the different different kind of lenses we're looking through, um, and the invitation I, I think as you, you kind of suggest is is the um, is can I meet this? Yes, it's a different. If I, if I look through this lens, actually, things are different than I, if when I look through a, another lens, because the way I'm looking is actually affecting, obviously, what I'm looking at. It's not like there's this solid thing that's there and it remains the, the same, you know, whether the way of looking um, is part of what is seen, you know. That's the nature of what the Buddha taught as dependent, dependent originally, origination or dependent arising, that everything is not, you know, nothing has an inherent solid existence to it. So if we can learn to accept and be okay with the changing ways of seeing of like, okay, this moment is like this you know it's not the same as it was five minutes ago if we look 
I mean, each one of us, if we were to kind of shift the spotlight inward on our sen ourselves and say, what am I feeling now compared with what I was feeling five minutes ago? We'd probably say, oh, there's some shift has taken place. And that can, that can be kind of understood as like everything is always changing and yeah, ho-hum, so what? But, but there's something more deeper in it as well. It really is, as like Diane was saying, it's like, it's like a shaking up of the kaleidoscope, you know? It's just a whole different thing now by virtue of what I'm bringing to it and the way of looking that I'm using for, you know, for, for, um, for, for that moment, for that occasion or whatever. You know, so um, so thank you for sharing that, Diane. And um, I just see if there's a there's a couple of questions in the comments in the chat. Yes, um, who do we have? We have uh, Cloud. Do you have? Are you uh, are you unmuted? <clears throat> yes, but I thought you were going to to switch to the chat, so I'm <laughs> I didn't. Um, one, one thing that came up for me uh, when you were listing the type of the attitudes uh, that we could promote access to the freedom we are looking for is the, the beginner mind. And I feel so trapped in patterns that I feel if I can remember beg beginner. Yeah. <laughs> beginner mind, it really helps me to, to get out of my <laughs> trance. <laughs> and, and this, yeah, I just wanted to just pop up in my mind. Yeah, lovely, lovely, thank you. I think, I think that's a very powerful one because it really, if we really practice bringing a beginner's mind to our experience, then we are actually doing that. We're, we're actually acknowledging that, yes, this is a fundamentally new reality, this moment, than even the moment before and the moment later. It's like, okay. So it's an orientation. And, you know, it's, it's the, the beginner's mind is a way of looking. We're, we're actually saying, I am going to cultivate, adopt, this way of way of looking at my experience and in doing that with enough training and enough practice every moment as T.S. Eliot said is a new and shocking valuation of all we have been there's kind of some a little different from what we're saying but every moment is is new and fresh never been before experience which is really the the deeper truth about life and experience but it's one that we that we so easily and so often miss because we're not in a beginner's mind we're like oh i know this i've heard this before oh he said that before or this you know and so we have to keep kind of inviting that opening to okay this moment this can i see this moment anew or fresh so thank you, Cloud, for um, for your uh, for for your sharing. You may I add something? Yes, please. This is there. So I've been I've been meditating for a long time, and I, the, the mindfulness practice has been very helpful for me over the years. And I've uh, th through this last year, I've been meditating very consistently throughout this year. But I also find myself getting judgmental of myself when I get stuck because I've been practicing so much. I feel like I shouldn't be getting stuck on X now because I've really applied myself to this practice. And so it's a, like a triple arrow to myself um, because especially throughout this year, I've really been very, very consistent. Um, and I find the irony in that, and you mentioned that in your, in your, in your comment and that really resonated with me in your talk. Um, and sometimes I even need to let go, uh, be more conscious of letting go about myself. And I, I feel I'm extra critical of myself now that I've progressed along as far as I have. It's interesting. Yeah, thank you. That's great. That's great. Then, um, 
you know, in, I find when when judgment is really strong in that sense, you know, oh, I've done such a good job and now, you know, I'm failing in some way or I'm not reaching the mark. The more we can bring in the door or the, the way of looking of self-compassion, particularly, you know, compassion towards suffering, there's suffering there. Can I turn that compassion inward on myself? Then self-compassion helps hold and transform that judging feeling, that criticism and all of that. And it changes it. So that then becomes a very skillful, very helpful, very valuable doorway or way of looking at experience. So it's great to, and it's, it's great, as you've said, and it's also kind of humbling to, for us to kind of see, oh, there I go again, I get caught, you know, I've been practicing all this time or all these years and I should be better than this. It's like, oh, okay, this is where I am right now. And if I'm adding shoulds, then I'm just adding suffering. I'm adding second arrows and third arrows to, to the experience. So thank you for sharing that, Eric. Very, thank you. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, we're going to have a, 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 um, a treat um, in, in the announcements. So I want to make sure we have time for that. So let's take, um, let's take uh, just a short time for a, for a final meditation. This will only be five or seven minutes, but enough, hopefully, for us to re-arrive, settle again. So take some, some moments to find a comfortable, relaxed posture again. Let the shoulders relax, chest be open so you can breathe easily hands in the lap or on the knees. Maybe taking a deeper breath or two to just settle back, back into being here. Notice if you're coming out of one mode, which may be more kind of thinking in the head, kind of more conceptual, and just inviting yourself into feeling feeling the body, connecting with the body. Feel the breath, feel the contact with the surface beneath you. Perhaps inviting the smile to help you settle a little bit more. And opening to whatever's arising, whatever's predominant in your experience. See if you can just be aware of it, letting, letting it come and go. So whatever's here, you don't have to get in a struggle with. And just consciously invite kind, accepting, non-judging awareness. All of these qualities, these ways of looking at our experience where we're accepting what's here, we're bringing kindness to ourselves. We're not judging. And if we are judging, we're trying, we're meeting our judgment with non-judgment. We're inviting kindness, interest, curiosity. And whatever helps you <clears throat> helps you to be here, to be present, using the breath as an anchor, if that's helpful. Or letting the awareness be open and spacious. As with the meditation we did earlier, 
whatever's helpful for you right now. As we move closer to our, the end of our time together, just invite you to take a nice in breath. And as you breathe in, just invite a quality of compassion towards yourself, kindness towards yourself. As you breathe in, breathing in kindness, care, maybe with a hand on your heart, recognizing the challenges that you have and the struggles, and wishing yourself well as we breathe in. May I be happy, may I be safe, whatever expression in words or wordlessly you want to send to yourself, bring to yourself. And breathing out inviting a wish, an intention of, of kindness and compassion to someone else or loving kindness to someone else or to a group of people or to everyone. Breathing in kindness to yourself, breathing out kindness to someone or some others to all beings. To finish meditation, you might take a moment to reflect on your intention or whether you'd like to cultivate an intention as you go back, as we go back into our lives and families and communities and work, etc. An intention that we go back into the week with might be a, an intention of loving kindness or compassion or wise speech. Just a way of looking, a way of being that would bring some healing into our lives, into our families, our communities, our world, so that we can consciously see ourselves as kind of formal way of saying it would be as a bodhisattva, but as whether that way of looking resonates or just someone wishing to help heal the suffering of the world, a 
don't care about suffering. Just imagine the difference it could make all of us, all those who are committed to waking up, bringing, bringing, consciously bringing compassion and caring into our world. Let all, all people be free of suffering, all beings. Remembering the lines from Mary Oliver's poem, The Summer Day. She's been walking in the fields all day. She says, tell me what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What is it that we plan to do with our one wild and precious life. Taking your time coming back into the group, 